we are thrilled to be joined on another SnapRaise live webinar uh, by three outstanding athletic directors, very well revered and well respected in their communities. We've got Lance Walker from uh, Trustville City Schools in Alabama. We've got Amanda Waters from Modern Day High School in Santa Ana, California. And we have Janice Williamson from Bryan ISD in Texas. And you know they have been such great champion athletic directors for their communities and, and we've worked with them in fundraising uh, for their teams, groups and clubs. And so it's been uh, a great experience for us. We're happy to share their insights as they go into uh, you know, what, uh, what best practices they're sharing with their, with their coaches and with their, their athletes to make sure that the athletic season uh, goes on as well as possible, as smoothly as possible. And we are thrilled for all three of them to be here today. Thank you guys for joining me. Thank Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. We've got, we've got athletic directors from all over the country. I, I see Kalahale High School in, in, uh, in Hawaii with Mark. I see uh, Mr. Durfee down in Arizona. I see uh, the state of Washington and California represented and, and certainly a few others. So uh, appreciate everyone for joining us. You know, we're going to encourage you to submit questions. We want to know uh, what you guys are, are looking to hear from from these three athletic directors who are in various phases of of opening, you know, with their athletics. You know, Lance is going to be um, having his football team uh, with their first game Friday on the road against Pinson Valley, and then they're going to be at home the following week. And so you know, we'll be able to t to talk about their attendance and and what things are going to look like for them. Janice is. Uh, they're, they're starting school tomorrow with uh, a hybrid option of remote and then also in-person education and instruction. And then Amanda's athletics got delayed, um, you know, throughout the state of California uh, for the fall and, and being one of the best athletic programs in the entire country. Uh, certainly some unique investigations there. So we encourage you to submit questions through the GoToWebinar control panel. You'll see that on the right side of your screen. And, uh, and we, we uh, will be happy to select a winner or two to give some custom logoed face masks and uh, a Leaders and Legends Snap Raise Live uh, hoodie right there that you see on your screen. Love to reward the, the participants. So would, would love to start with, with you, Janice. You guys, you've, you know, you've been in Bryan ISD for four decades. Um, you are a, a fixture in the community. I'm, I'm sure you've never seen anything quite like this before. As you guys get ready to start school tomorrow, you know, what provisions have you put in place to try and maximize the experience and the opportunity for your coaches and your athletes to have a rewarding, enriching, regular school year? So we have uh, been actually working out since June 8th with strength and conditioning. And then a month later, the UIL allowed sports specific. So uh, we've gone through and, and trained our coaches coaches and our athletes that, that we need to wear a mask if we want to be able to have a season. Uh, we sanitize uh, all of our uh, facilities after every use. Uh, we have no shared water. Um, we purchased ele electrostatic sprayers to go in with vital oxide and, and clean the area. Um, the, the hand sanitizer and We've been very fortunate in, in the couple of months, we have had to have a couple of our cohorts, uh, when someone was exposed to someone who was positive, we had to send some kids home for two weeks. But with all that said, uh, we've had really no athlete to athlete transmission uh, of the disease. So it's really worked out pretty good for us and, and the protocols have, have been spot on. Lance, you guys open up this week on the road, uh, and you're you're facing Pinson Valley again, just like you did last year. And you've got an awesome football squad out there, and, and Coach Floyd is terrific. You've got Armani Goodwin, who ran for 227 yards and four touchdowns in the opener last year, and and you'll be going against the uh, the cool named Kool Aid McKinstry and Keontes Johnson for Pinson Valley. So I'm sure you guys uh, are excited about that. What uh, what does the football preparation look like for you guys, and what's the excitement like, you know, for the upcoming season? Well, I think I'm most impressed by your uh, research for game one. That's that's pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a uh, you know, like everyone else, this is a season opener uh, like no other before. Um, you, you know, I would say the the coach and I have spent an enormous amount of time on everything but football or everything but the game. 
Um, so, you know, our game on Friday, uh, the first week of the season, this is a 15 minute trip uh, for us. And so, you know, you start with, uh, we're actually uh, wearing our uniform, pants, pads, all that um, onto the bus uh, because uh, the visiting locker room area, you know, we don't, we don't feel like it's um, big enough to be able to space and socially distance and those type of things. Uh, we're taking more buses uh, than we normally would in a normal year uh, for, you know, to socially distance and get as few people on the bus as we can. Um, you know, a lot of the, most of the schools here in our area, uh, us included, we've gone to a cashless and contactless entry into our athletic events. Uh, we work with GoFan on that. Uh, so we, you know, fans are able to pre-purchase tickets. We have self checkout stands um, outside the venue for the people that need to pay once they get there. Uh, to just take away the cash and the card uh, passing back and forth. Um, our state has allowed the uh, the team box on the sideline to now go from the 10 yard line to the 10 yard line. So, you know, we have a, you know, we have a plan in place kind of between the 40s as only coaches and someone that might be subbed into the game, you know, right then. And uh, everyone else is, is kind of on the outside, you know, with masks on and, um, you know, kind of being down the sideline uh, somewhat. Um, you know, a lot of our communication with our parents and people coming to the game, um, you know, revolves around uh, trying to distance, you know, everyone in our state uh, is under some type of capacity uh, mandate uh, that's up to each school. So, you know, for our home games, we spent a lot of time um, the last couple of weeks determining uh, how we were going to do that, how many general admission tickets we were going to sell. Um, and how we were going to properly uh, kind of spread everyone apart. So, it, you know, there's there's probably a list of 50 things that we've worked on for this Friday's road game that, you know, a year ago we would have never dreamed about talking about. Yeah, and I see that for your home game, you've got a thousand tickets planned out. And, and Janice and I were talking, you know, the state mandated no more than 50 percent capacity, but then also mandated being six feet apart. How is it that you settled on, you know, the attendance numbers for your, for your various fall sports? Uh, well, we, you know, at our at our football stadium, the actual seating is about 5,300. So, you know, when we cut that in half, you know, we were in the 2650 range um, right there close to it. Uh, and then, you know, before we talked about the general admission tickets, you know, we're talking about band. Uh, we allow teachers to come in with their teaching badge, you know, coaching cards, student pass, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you have a lot of, I'm sure like everyone else, you know, you have a lot of people that are there that uh, aren't exactly going through the front gate with a ticket. Um, so, you know, we, we did the best job that we could um, kind of brainstorming a number for those groups. And that left us uh, with the thousand that we sold. Um, and in our state, you know, we were told to, you know, we had to make those tickets available for the visiting fans, kind of an equal access. So, you know, at the same time we sent out that ticket link uh, to our community, the visiting uh, community had that link as well. So, um, you know, I think within maybe 36 hours, we sold out two of our five home games, uh, you know, cause you know, we had some games last year where we, you know, we would have eight, 9,000 people at the game uh, cause we have a lot of standing area and a lot of, you know, just a lot of area to hang out that's not in the stands. So um, it's going to be a it's going to be a big change. Um, our community, you know, loves football and really supports the school. So um, you know, it's um, it's unfortunate that there's only going to be that many people there. But again, we're just excited to uh, give our kids the opportunity to play, and it's kind of what we have to do to do it. Well, football games with eight or 9,000 people in attendance is not foreign to schools in the state of Texas, nor modern day high school with Bruce Rollison being uh, a faculty member for 40 years and coaching there for over 25 years as a head coach with uh, several national championships under his belt. And Amanda, you had the good fortune of walking in as a newly appointed athletic director to a season that has been postponed. Uh, what have your early months been like on the job? You know, uh, trial by fire is the best way to put it. <laughs> um, you know what, it's, it's, uh, it's been interesting for me because I started July 1st and I come from a public school realm and now I'm at private school. So that's a whole different world in itself. 
Um, but modern day athletics in general is they're so it's such an amazing place. And um, we're kind of a small college, which is kind of amazing, too. Uh, we, you know, it's exciting to hear what Lance is doing and Janice is doing. And for us, we're still kind of in that waiting period. Like we know December 14th, we can start, but we're still unsure what that looks like. Like, are they going to allow us to have fans? Are, are, are we going to have that option? Are we, um, you know, and if we don't, how are we going to get the 8,000, 9,000 people to watch the game that would normally come? So we're looking at like, obviously we've worked with GoFan in the past as well with our digital tickets if we have that option um, and, the, and the scanning and the stuff like Lance talked about. Um, but then we're talking about what if we don't have any fans? What if they say Orange County is still shut down and we can't, then we go with cameras, right? Maybe we do the, the Pixelot type thing or, or we're through Huddle and we, we live stream all of our games or use our, our TV station we have here. So it's a lot of logistics and, it, and it's always the unknown. So you're kind of planning for everything and hoping for normalcy. <laughs> yeah, but I completely understand. That. Yeah, but we have off season starting. We we started off season on Monday, and a lot of the protocols of what Jana said um, are very similar to us. Like we we have the spray system in our weight rooms that basically just sprays all the kettlebells and the weights, which is great. Uh, we will use the same for football pads and helmets um, when the game's over, so that you know it's it's I guess what they call COVID killer cleaner. You know, and every district has their own protocols, but um, so for us, that's kind of what they call it to ensure the kids safety. And then obviously masks um, everywhere. Anytime you're on campus, uh, if you're in the middle of a game, obviously you don't have to wear a mask, but you're on the sidelines standing around, you should all be in a mask. So, and it's, it's really kind of interesting. The kids and everybody's so excited to be back, but it's also a challenge because kids are still kids. You know, they still want to congregate. They still want to give each other hugs. They still want to be around each other. And you just, it's kind of like a constant reminder, like, you don't want to be shut down again. Let's all do this together. So it's kind of like a we mentality um, and getting them to really kind of buy into we don't want to be shut down again. So um, our camps have gone really well the first couple of days. Um, some different protocols in place, uh, a little more safe, a little more eyes on things um, to kind of help the coaches so that all the pressure is not on them. Um, so we all can kind of do it together. Uh, so, I mean, that's kind of where we're at at this point. Lance, you guys are are pretty much wide open. Uh, and I understand maybe gators being worn more than masks down there. What is the PPE and protective protective equipment look like for your your players and your coaches and, and what provisions are you taking for fans at attendance in the game? Yeah, well, you know, our state has been really, really good about sending out information really, you know, since March when, when all of this started and we were shut down. Um, so, you know, our our wording as far as a game would go is, you know, the only time a player or coach doesn't have to have a mask on is if they're actively participating in the game. Um, so, you know, obviously the guys on the field uh, wouldn't, but, um, you know, like Amanda mentioned, the, the guys that are on the sideline would just have that with them and, and would have it on. Um, and, and same goes for the stands. You know, our state actually put out um, guidance for fans attending games that uh, kind of included some of the capacity, um, wording, uh, distancing, wearing a mask. Um, so, you know, really a lot of the last couple of months has been uh, just trying to get all this information out uh, to everyone, whether it's your community or, or the communities that are that are playing, uh, just to let everybody know what the expectations are. So, you know, and you know, we've, we've talked about, you know, talking about the sideline, we've we've talked about different ways we're dealing with water because, of course, you know, when we play on Friday, it'll be, you know, a thousand degrees here with 100 percent humidity. So, um, you know, that's that's an issue um, that, that everybody's worried about. So we've actually got a, you know, a big squeeze bottle for every player and coach on the team and we have them, you know, labeled with their jersey number on them. So, again, it's just things you would never think about before um but you know we're just and we're having we have practices now we have we have at football practice we're practicing these things about where to stand during a game and okay when i need water where is it and how things are numbered uh you know so it's just it's just a new it's a new thing for everyone well you know speaking to your you know your resources and getting the information out uh Brian's got a question revolving around resources and where you guys are getting your information. I think now would be 
a good time and a plug for the National Athletic Directors Resources Network, Amanda, that, that you uh, very competently and capably spearhead. And, and I'd love to hear from you more about what you're doing with your Zoom calls and your outreach and then, you know, where you, Lance and Janice are, are getting your information from. But Amanda, I'll allow you to, to tee this one up. You know, it's so interesting because uh, when we first started the National AD uh, Resource Network, um, Ira Childress in Florida is a buddy of mine, and he reached out and said, how many people are contacting you? Like, no one knows what to do. And and I think information is is extremely important in communication and having people and resources you can pull from. So uh, every week, um, you know, we discuss different things on what's happening and, and what protocols different states are coming up with. And um, we kind of grab ideas from different people. So we hear from California from me and Florida from Ira and um, today we heard from Maine and New Jersey and Illinois because um, we had our call this morning. And so it's really interesting because it gives resources to people that may not have those type of connections yet in their state. And they may be able to connect with people on the call from their state. So a lot of times you'll look at the chat and it'll be like someone from Minnesota who wants to connect with someone else from Minnesota. And then they start their own group. And, and that's the biggest thing for me is it's not necessarily that everybody needs to be on our call every week. It's communicate and get to know people that you may meet on the call and then communicate them after or start your own state group or as long as we're and the biggest thing too, JT is helping new ADs. This has got to be one of the hard. It's hard for older ADs like I've been an AD for a while and I know Janice and Lance as well. Can you imagine being a first year AD and having zero idea what you're doing? Like it's already hard enough because you have no idea what you're doing in your first year anyway, let alone now all of this stuff. So um, I think that's been a, a big thing too. And, and a lot of reached out with various questions like help on their resumes and how to get here and there. Uh, and so it's navigating and having a network where we are stronger together. And I, I always, people laugh at me because I say it all the time, but as ADs, some people don't ask us all the time, are you, how are you doing? You know, are you okay? And, and it's okay to not be okay. And I think that's the biggest message is as ADs, we're supposed to be the leaders and the powerful and the always strong and never sad. But there's no way our heart doesn't break for these student athletes. Our heart breaks for these coaches. Our heart breaks for the parents. And so how do we get that across to explain to ADs, it's okay to not be okay, do some self-care, get talk to people and make sure that you're okay. Because if you're okay, your coaches will be okay and your kids will be okay. And it's relaying that message down, which is our biggest message when we have those meetings. Janice, uh, what is your, you know, well-being check, your welfare check on your athletes and coaches look like? And then, you know, where are you finding your resources? You seem like you're really dialed in, well-planned, well-measured. What are you, what are you doing to be so successful in, in trying to navigate the uncertain times? Well, you know, we, we have checked in on our coaches and I, I meet with uh, our coordinators for the two high schools uh, almost daily and, and we talk. But in Texas, we're fortunate we've got the Texas Athletic Directors Association, and it, Texas is divided into regions. So each of those regions has a regional meeting once a month. So this summer, they opened up all those meetings to all ADs. And so I've logged into the regional meeting from Houston, from Austin, from the Valley. And uh, the other nice thing is that uh, the UIL, our governing body, uh, the directors come to those regional meetings, some well, other Zoom meetings, and explain what's going on in the state, how they're working with the Center for Disease Control, uh, Texas Education Agency. So all of us are coordinating together, and no one has to. Uh, take care of everything. Everybody's pitching in and sharing how they're dealing with it. And so it's made it really easy to have other people who are in the same boat sharing what works. And so uh, as the volleyball game, first volleyball games in Texas were yesterday and, and then football at the locals, the smaller schools, uh, there's a scrimmage this Friday. So um, everybody's sort of pitching in. And, and like she said, Amanda said, learning from one another and making sure that things are good. Uh, I visit with our athletes, you know, behind my mask, but uh, I, I see them working hard this summer at strength and conditioning. And the UIL allowed two hours of sports specific camp. And so 
Our, our kids are out on the fields. They're playing. They're they're working hard. Everybody, you know, it, it's it's the thing about athletes. They all want to play and participate. And after losing those seasons this past spring, it's just more important to them than ever to be back on the field participating and and having that opportunity to play uh, as soon as we can get back. Yeah, Lance, uh, just to follow up, uh, you know, resources, check, welfare checks on your, your players and coaches and where you're finding your resources for guidance through the through the times. Yeah, well, I, I agree with everything that Janice and Amanda have said. Um, you know, it's been a lot of communication through us, uh, you know, for all of us uh, throughout the summer, a lot of Zoom calls. Uh, you know, we we've, we've gotten great information from our association as far as you know, we, we were able to start in early June with our off season summer workouts as well. Um, so we, we've gotten a lot of great information in terms of um, kind of how to move forward with each step. Um, but, you know, especially here in the Birmingham area, uh, a lot of teams that are in our region that we play against in every sport, uh, our group of ADs have, have communicated a lot, uh, really with, with all of these issues, because, you know, most of the time, uh, someone brings up a question, uh, they're not the only one with that question. Uh, so it's been great. You know, we've had some calls uh, just between kind of the AD group uh, going through things. And and it's always um, reassuring to see how others are handling the situation and uh, being able to grow from that. Well, a question here from Mark Durfee down in Arizona, an athletic director down there. He asked, how many extra staff managers or volunteers you guys utilizing just to deal with the COVID related issues. He said maybe 20% in staffing or more. And, and I know I was, I was talking to a, a booster club parent in Alaska and, you know, they're, they've got volunteers out there spraying down the, you know, the, the pads and the different football equipment. And then, you know, they're wearing, you know, masks at volleyball practice and having to, you know, alternate new volleyballs in, uh, you know, regularly and spraying them down and everything. So what is, uh, we'll, we'll start with you, Janice. What uh, what have you guys seen in terms of an uptick in staff volunteering, um, extra help out there, and in, in helping to manage the COVID-related issues for your teams? Actually, all of our coaches have been back this summer working strength and conditioning, and sports specific, and and so forth. Um, interesting enough, we don't allow volunteers and in our facilities. We, we find it um, difficult to, to, to make sure that everybody is, is you know, safe, taken care of. Uh, we do the temperature checks. We do all the pre-screening with our athletes before they come in, but all that's done by the coaching staff. Our athletic trainers have been the ones that go in and, and spray the weight rooms and uh, the coaches help out, but pretty much it's been all of our coaches hands on deck um, they're actually not paid this summer, so I guess they're all volunteers. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Lance, what about you guys? You've had a lot of uh, you know, probably the most activity around your athletic program, uh, you know, comparatively to the other athletic directors on this call and most of the other athletic directors across the country. What does your response look like? Uh, I think very similar to, to what Janice said, um, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, we're kind of at full staff on you know, with all of our sports, but I think it's just been a, an increased awareness of what's going on and uh, everyone pitching in. Uh, you know, I think, you know, every district is different, but I know with our school, you know, our school administration, um, our custodial staff, you know, those, those type of groups, um, you know, probably uh, just an increased awareness um, of athletics and where kids are going to be uh, and those type of things. So, uh, we really haven't added, a, you know, a massive group of people or anything like that. I think it's just sort of a team effort of everyone that was already here, um, just understanding what the protocols are and working together to get them done. Uh, a question here uh, for Amanda, just based on the costs, you know, cleaning supplies and masks and everything like that, you in California are probably feeling that pinch more than most. And with a, you know, a nationally acclaimed athletic department. I'm wondering, you know, where the, the funding comes from. I know you're, you know, an athletic director at a private school, but certainly when the, when the budget changes and the needs change, you know, what, what does that look like from, uh, you know, a budget and a management standpoint on your end? 
Yeah, you know, um, we've we've kind of very similar to Lance, where we've kind of been in like an all hands on deck. So, um, you know, our athletic training staff and our strength and conditioning staff, who have been kind of months without kids around, we've kind of had them jump in with certain things. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, cleaning supplies across the board, um, it's expensive, you know, between masks and cleaning supplies, and then every room has to have certain things, and we have emergency kits in each room um signage and all of those things but we're so lucky I, I have to say we have a very group a large group of alumni who kind of banded together with our advancement um team uh and and really kind of set forth like a, a fundraising uh platform to say hey we need to we need some help in these areas you know because we are a private school and we also have some parents that both parents are losing jobs so how do they keep their kid where we where we are? So uh, we've had some really great uh, alumni groups and and support from our alumni uh, to let all of that happen. So at this point, it hasn't hurt us too much um, because of those factors. Uh, and then the whole hands on deck with the staff um, it hasn't hurt us with staffing either. And we've paid our coaches. Um, we haven't eliminated stipends or any of those things. Uh, so so we've been pretty lucky with that. I know some states have had COVID related money earmarked for programs. So Janice, I same question to you around, you know, the increase in costs. Um, how have you guys handled that from a you know, school district standpoint? Our district's been uh, very supportive in anything we've asked for. Uh, they've been willing to purchase. Uh, we, we have this issue with uh, the the water. And so we are purchasing now some their foot pedals that attach to your water hydration units, your cows. And so uh, those are some things that, that we're purchasing. Uh, the state of Texas actually uh, is sending like thousands of masks and hand sanitizer and, and all kinds of things to the school districts uh, to help out as well. But early on, we were self-funded. And uh, we did actually though, because all of the spring sports were canceled, there was money left in budgets, uh, transportation, mill money, entry fees, all those things that weren't used was available. So uh, the hardest part is finding it and, and being able to have availability for those things. So we started purchasing early on and, and I feel like we're in pretty good shape, but uh, that was the challenge where we find it. And if you've got the money for it, is it available? Lance, same question to you, just based around the finances and managing things, uh, you know, with the additional expenses that COVID created. Yeah, you know, our our district has been very supportive also. And, I, you know, I think the feeling is, you know, hey, if our students are, are on campus inside a facility, you know, we're going to do our part to, you know, make sure that um, it's as clean as possible. And, and, you know, there were some you know, especially up front, uh, there were a lot of things that, that we had to do from a cleaning standpoint with weight room and hand sanitizer and those type of things. But um, our district's been very supportive in, in making sure that, that we're prepared for the things that we've, that we've done. Certainly want to encourage people to submit questions through the GoToWebinar control panel there. Uh, any individual questions or group questions are certainly welcomed. Um, a lot has changed, um, but some of the stuff has stayed the same. So with your relationship with your coaches, um, certainly it, it varies, right? It, we've, we've surveyed coaches and we, we try and build solutions for coaches and athletic directors. And we understand that there's a varying level of, of uh, interaction that takes place. Is the unintended benefit maybe a, a better connectivity with some of your staff and better communication because it's been necessary and mandated that way. Amanda, for you and in your job, you've probably gotten off to a really good start connecting with all of your coaches because it's necessary, right? Yeah, you know, and I think anytime you're dealing with something that's different, you kind of got to take positives out of it, right? And I and I think for me, um, it's having the time to be able to get to know them, to be able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, to be able to go out and see how they're doing. Um, but also to ask them how they're doing, like build that relationship from the beginning. Like, yes, I'm new, but how are you doing? And, and again, it's, I don't know how many people ask, actually ask that question to their coaches and, you know, coaches are tough guys, you know, like I'm a tough guy. I'm good. Like, and I coached for a long time. So I was the same way. Like, don't ask me how I'm doing. I'm good. 
But once in a while, it's nice to just have someone say, no, really, are you okay? You know, and I think it's given me time to do that and build the relationships. And on the other hand, it's also given the student athletes the opportunity that none of us ever had to have six months off. You get six months, like work out at your house, to become creative, to learn how to Zoom, to learn how to think outside the box. And sometimes being uncomfortable is kind of where we need to be to learn. So as much as there's so much negative, and, and believe me, I get it. Um, try to pull some of those positives like what have I really learned in this whole thing you know and then these kids are more resilient than we give them credit for for one and the coaches and the ADs and the administration and the plans they've come up with for returning to school with hybrids and remote learning and I mean that was an all summer try to figure this stuff out stuff like if that doesn't sell education I don't know what does so for me um, yeah building relationships with everybody from admin to coaches to players um, and having coaches reach out to players and ask how they're doing. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely given a good opportunity for that. You all have a college athletics background and and if I read right, the NCAA has waived the test score requirement for you know incoming freshmen the coming year, which unintentionally probably devalues the academic component. So Janice, as you've got some athletes that are going to be at home remote, uh, potentially more disengaged, you know, what did the academic standards look like for you guys in terms of, you know, continuing to foster the growth and the development of your teams, but, you know, with some being in person, some being remote, how do you continue to champion the, the need for education in the, the athletic space? You know, and, and that is a good question. Uh, in the spring, you know, it was toward the end of school, so we we're trying to, you know, just make it out and everyone survive. And so this year coming back, we're taking a look going, uh, our online learning has to be a lot more rigorous. It, it has to uh, resemble and, and, and be the same quality that they get in the classroom. And so we bought Schoology and then the state of Texas came in and provided it for everyone. But those online learning systems are, are very important. And the, the teachers have, have taken a look at that too because they're saying okay we've got kids in in school and then we've got kids online you give them the same test there's no way to proctor those those kids who are online so you know all of that's kind of working together I, i'm glad to see that the ncaa did relax a few of those things because really the testing opportunities weren't available for the kids you know so much of it was shut down and uh the grades and and, and all of that was going to be very difficult for them. So I think that was a necessary relaxation of, of some of those requirements so the kids could move on. But I think as we go further, you're exactly right. We've got to make sure their academic success is, is truly that and that they're getting from these classes what they need. So uh, that's something that our district is, is really pursuing, trying to make sure that the online learning is of the same quality as what they get in the classroom. And that's why we have the hybrid model so that those kids who are need to be in labs, need to be with their teachers and so forth, they can come to school for that part of learning and then we're allowing them to, to go back home uh, because the parents don't feel safe. Possibly in their house and even their house for the whole day. The whole day. Lance, I same question to you. You know, and you spent a decade at Alabama helping academically there, and so you are probably more qualified than most to speak on this. What does the um, academic component look like meshing with the the athletic responsibilities that you have as the AD there? We in Alabama we're using the same online platform, uh, you know, virtually as as Texas is. So, you know, for for some of our athletes, you know, we have we have several options right now. We started school here last week uh, with a staggered start, but we have some athletes going five days a week. We have some that are fully virtual and we have some that are um, kind of a hybrid where they're popping in and out for a couple of periods or class. So, um, you know, a lot of it has been um, just communication, especially with the coaches. Um, I know have been working really hard with you know, making sure they're doing what they need to and, and staying up to date, especially uh, the ones that aren't at school the whole time. 
because uh, um, you know sometimes that can get lost a little bit. So again, it's kind of a it's kind of a new thing for everyone, but you know I do feel like we're in a better spot right now than we were in March because you know we did get those three weeks. At our, I'm sorry, those three months in the spring where where everyone was virtual. Um, so you know kids I think got used to that. Uh, parents also and our coaches um, you know following up with with grades and progress reports and all those type of things. Amanda, the same question to you related to academics and and I know, for example, like CAPS in Texas is allowing you know private schools to operate under different um, rules and regulations versus the UIL. And so you know the the private schools in in California, you know what does it look like for you, and how are you guys proceeding? You know, for us, um, you know, the governor came out with a watch list. So, and because we're in Orange County, we're on the watch list. So we have to be off the list. Um, we have to be we have to be below certain numbers for three straight days, and then we get off the list, and then we have to wait 14 days. So the moment we get off that list, we're already prepared to submit. We submit plans to our health department, um, and they approve us or not. Now. Our admin has done a fantastic job where we actually have a college type schedule coming. So it's a hybrid. So you have morning classes and you have afternoon classes. So the morning classes, um, all of those kids, if they're athletes, will have their practices in the afternoon. Whereas all the afternoon classes will have their practices in the morning. So it's kind of opening up all of our facilities, which is really nice. So everything doesn't have to be in the afternoon. Um, but we have to get to the hybrid. Like right now we're starting in remote learning on the 31st. The plan is we'll probably be in that for at least um, possibly longer, obviously. Um, but as soon as we go to the to the hybrid model, you still have some kids that choose to do remote. Various reasons, right? And not everybody wants to talk about why. Maybe grandma is sick or someone in their family is is you know high risk. So I think out of respect for all of those, almost every district at least in California, I would imagine is gonna have some type of a remote learning option for those types of students. Um, I have an 11 and 13 year old, so I, I they are ready to go back to school and I am ready to send them back to school. I'm not gonna lie, I am not a stay at home teacher. Uh, I've been a teacher for 22 years, but you know, last year it was fifth and seventh grade and I'm like, what? I mean, I'm not that old, but I don't remember some of that stuff. So um, this year I have a tutor who does know those things so they'll be good to start the remote. Um, but no, I, I think if schools can do it safely, which I, I really have hope and, and feel that they will uh, take these seriously, like our class sizes won't be bigger than 12. Could you imagine being in a class of 12 kids in high school? Like one, you can't get away with anything, right? So that, you might as well be on point. And two, you can totally social distance, you know, or you have pod groups or, so it's, it's they've worked so hard and I'm so impressed. Like I would send my kids here in a second. So that's how confident I am in our plan once we actually get the go for it. So hoping soon. Another cost related question. So Janice, I'll kick it back to you. Just wondering what parent support has been like in terms of you know fundraisers or you know local businesses. Has support cut back that way? And and how do you expect things going forward to maybe equalize when the state no longer is providing support? You know, are, are you going to be able to rely on the community to, to support some of the costs associated with running successful athletics like you have in the past? You know, our, our parents have been very supportive and um, there, you know, you do kind of wonder and, and worry a little bit because a lot of those parents aren't as fortunate as us. They, they don't have paychecks coming in and, and that kind of thing. And, and so uh, the money may be you know, a little bit more limited or fundraisers. I will say this though, our, our baseball team did use snap raise and uh, they had uh, like a $10,000 uh, goal and, and they doubled it. So the, the platform that you guys provide is to me less intrusive because you can send the email but you're not putting pressure on anyone face to face. If, if you can't give, then then that's fine. If those who can uh, have a nice, safe way to do it, and the kids don't have to be out face to face peddling anything and and that kind of thing. So uh, it, it worked well, and several of our groups are using it, and I see us continuing to do so. But but the fact that you know there's no pressure on anyone if you knock on a 
to sell something it is really a, a, a nice thing. Lance, Trustville City Schools has raised over $90,000 in the last uh, month or so with us. And so we're you know, thrilled to be able to help you guys that way. And Taylor Stevens is an awesome uh, rep for us in the great state of Alabama. Um, what has your experience been like, I guess, using SnapRaise and how have you found the community to be able to support the programs and, and stay engaged? Yeah, well, Taylor and I, um, you know, have worked together on a plan. You know, all of our sports programs here are, are doing a campaign at some point of the year. We kind of work together on a on a yearly schedule um, where every sport was going to do it uh, kind of, you know, right before the time that their practice was going to start, whenever that would be for fall, winter or spring sports. And, um, you know, we've gotten a tremendous amount of support uh, through this. Um, it's been great. Um, and, you know, we were talking about the capacity earlier for the football games, you know, so, you know, only having a thousand people at the game, that's a significant hit, um, you know, every week that you're, that you're hosting a home game. So to me, um, you know, what snap raise has given us and um, you know, how the community has supported that um, it's really offset um, all the other things that we've talked about with uh, limiting capacity or more money on cleaning supplies, um, so it's really um, it's really helped us uh, this year in particular kind of make up the difference for uh, things that we could have never seen before. Um, we also do we have a, a corporate partnership program that we do. So uh, this year due to COVID, you know, we were kind of out meeting with businesses or a lot of Zoom calls. Uh, we were only able to do about two months of that instead of four months like we normally would. Uh, but again, it was um, very positive in our community. Um, everyone, you know, wanting to support. Um, so, it, you know, it's just the timing of it. But um, we've had a great experience with uh, with SNAP uh, so far this fall and looking forward to, you know, a couple of our campaigns finishing up here uh, the next couple of weeks and then uh, kind of go to our winter sports from there. So, yeah, you got a got a cross country picture up there. So uh, they I think they have uh, they have about two weeks left in there. So they're about two weeks in. Um, so going well, though. And our and our cross country coach, he he had great advice. I thought at practice the other day when we were talking about some COVID issues, he told all the kids on the team. He said, "Look, if you just run fast and get far ahead of everybody, you won't have to worry about this." <laughs> great. <point. laughs> yeah, you could you could physically distance uh, and socially distance in the most responsible way possible. So yeah, that'd be great. Um, Amanda, your previous school, Carlsbad, had the largest single football campaign in uh, snap race history in San Diego, over $33,000. Uh, your softball and baseball teams were wrapping up their campaigns uh, while coronavirus was going on. Um, you know, what, what did things look like in your, your final months there and, and what, what were the budget constraints and how did you feel about, you know, the, the seasons going forward for the teams? Sure. You know, I think at a public school, uh, it's always important to kind of give different fundraising options for people. Right. And I think, um, we always have certain goals that that we want to set uh, in season and out of season, and obviously football is the big, a big, the big one of that. Um, so, yeah, football did again. Carlsbad had an amazing alumni community, um, and you can see even from you know South Carolina, they're getting donations. So, uh, yeah, I mean it's great online platform because it's easy for people to donate, and it's easy to understand why. You know you, the videos are great. You get to explain to them what they're what they're donating for, um, and so Carlsbad. Most of the teams used them, um, and if they didn't, uh, a lot of this information was shared with them. Like you need to get on board for sure. Sure, and how about that for a name? Ant Cake is rooting for the Lancers <laughs> from South Carolina. So. That's <laughs> funny because I, I, I know exactly who they're all talking about. So <laughs> everybody should have an Ant Cake. Um, yeah. Well, well, I, I want to, you know, you guys are kind of the coach of coaches, um, you know, and, and we say at SnapRaise, we want to champion the champions um, and help the, the people who are impacting the lives of the youth. And, and so uh, by way of you guys directing the coaches and the athletics programs, you certainly have a huge impact on all the community uh, and every, every team that you serve. And so Janice, you know, four years in Bryan ISD, you know, how rewarding has being an athletic director been? And, you know, how, how much do you look forward to each and every year to, to working with your coaches? You know, when um, I, I was, I've been a coach for over 30 years. And so 
um, my mother had gotten sick and, and needed more help, so I couldn't coach. And uh, so the athletic director position allowed me to still be involved with athletics and sports and to actually take what I had learned in my 30 years and kind of share it with some of the new coaches and the younger coaches coming up. So it allows me to serve our kids. And uh, I, I see my position as being one of service to make sure that all my coaches have all of the things that they need to be successful. And if, if they don't have it, then we're going to find a way to get it. But um, that, that's really how I see my position, uh, being one who kind of monitors and, and just makes sure that um, we are set for success and, and that our coaches have what they need to do their job. Lance, same same to you. Um, you know, serving all of the different group leaders and the and the coaches there. How rewarding is it for you to to be able to lead the athletics programs at uh, schools that you attended? Right. Uh, you know, my whole life I've been on a team, whether it's high school or college, little league, whatever it is. So I feel like this role still allows me to be on a team, uh, even though I'm old now. Um, but you know, we're we're fortunate to have a great team here with. Uh, you know, our school administration, our board of education, uh, the coaches that are here, the community, um, that, that's the way it feels is that it's kind of one big community, one big team, and everybody has the same goal. So uh, just to be a part of that, um, you know, is, is a great honor and, and really exciting. And, you know, all of these months, I mean, our last athletic event was March 13th. So um, you know, when we play, when we have a football game this Friday, uh, that's going to be the first time in a long time. And you realize, um, you know, how much that it means to everyone here and how much everyone is, has missed it. So, um, you know, I think everyone here is just thrilled to uh, have the opportunity and we're just uh, doing the best we can uh, to make it a good experience for everyone. Amanda, we'll, we'll end with you. And, and Lance had mentioned, you know, returning athletics and, and how great that is. It'll take a little bit longer for you guys in California, uh, unfortunately, and I'm from San Diego myself, so I, uh, you know, I, my heart goes out to the Coronado Islanders, uh, but, you know, what, what excitement do you have for this opportunity in front of you and, and the ability to engage one of the, maybe the, one of the best athletics programs in the entire country and their alumni and their coaching staff and their players and, and all of that opportunity? You know, it's interesting. Uh, first, I have to start with how jealous I am of Lance. So at some point, I have to send a video of like you on the field with kids because that's I'm so jealous of that. Um, you know, it's interesting for me because uh, I um, played college sports myself and my college basketball coach changed my life. And so when I got into being an AD, uh, I wanted I wanted my coaches to affect kids the way she affected me. And so I think for me, I coached for a long time. I coached basketball for a long time and softball a little bit. And um, that's kind of the coach that I've tried to be. And now that I'm an AD, I look at the things I would do differently now that I coach the coaches. <laughs> um, but I still go to the core thing of, you know, she changed my life. And there's so many amazing lessons you learn from sports. And so being at modern day for me, it's very humbling because you look at, transformational coaches, right? We talk a lot about um, building character and things like that. You have a Bruce L Rawlinson who's been here forever, right? Who's built an amazing program. You have Gary McKnight, you have Kevin Kiernan, you have all of these coaches who coming into this, I was a little intimidated. I'm not going to lie. I don't get intimidated very often, but I was like, I wonder how they're going to be. Are they going to be huge egos? Are they going to be welcoming? Um, best welcoming guys ever. And they're exactly the type of coaches that I'm talking about. Like, so for me, like my motivation is knowing that those kids are going to get those types of coaches and here it's like they're everywhere. So it's like, I can't wait to see kids on the field to see what they do. Um, and so it's, it's, it's humbling to be in this job. Um, but it's also like Lance said, it's nice to be part of a team, even though we're old. Um, I'm not playing basketball anytime soon. Um, but it's cool to be part of a team where, you feel like you're making a difference more than just, you know, coaching, you're making a difference with your team. When you're an AD, you can make a difference with a department. And, you know, my hope is that uh, for all of us, you know, again, the more communication we have that we can make a difference and a change across the board in athletics, um, starting to be more collaborative and having those conversations because no one's perfect and everyone can learn. So, um, 
So yeah, I, I, I love what I do. I do what I love and love what I do. <laughs> well, I know you guys are coaching the coaches, but you three were all standouts uh, in your sport. So I will respectively say to the Hassan Lancers, go Lancers, to the Alabama Crimson Tide, Roll Tide, and to the Texas A&M Aggies, gig them. Uh, so much love to, much love to all three of you. Uh, had to, had to do that. Had to. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. We we definitely want to say thank you to all three of you guys. And you know we continue to try and build resources and solutions for athletic directors. So if anyone on this call or if either of you, uh, any of you three panelists would like to be a part of a focus group that we're putting together, we're always trying to figure out how we can make things easier. And so we, we definitely want feedback and, uh, and you can engage us or we certainly will continue to reach out to you in trying to build solutions to make the lives easier for administrators, coaches, athletic directors and such, um, because that is a primary focus of ours. So all three of you will be getting hoodies and face masks, the leaders and legends, uh, and, and we're gonna need to get your size, Amanda, and because uh, we just got you late, um, but, we're also going to send one to Mark Durfee. We're going to send some custom logo face masks uh, with your school logo on it and, uh, and, and a custom Leaders and Legends uh, hoodie for you as well. So we appreciate the heck out of all of you guys for joining us today. And you were all so terrific. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Any last words? We'll, we'll go uh, one by one, Jana. Thank you. Anything from you? You know, I just appreciate you all and for giving us this forum. Uh, because that is how we learn. If, if I can get one thing from a, a group of people I'm visiting with, then I'm one thing better. So appreciate you. Appreciate Snap Raise for making it easy for our coaches to to raise some money to get those few extra things that they want for their kids. So thank you. You bet. Our pleasure, Lance. Any final thoughts, final words from you, please? No, I'd, I'd like to thank you and also Janice and Amanda for their uh, for their thoughts today. You know, I, I I learned a lot just from being on the call. Um, I'd also like to to thank SnapRaise. Um, you know, we're having a great experience with that right now, currently. Um, and you know, with with our program, all of our sports, we want to give all of our kids a first class experience, and we want to you know compete at a championship level in every sport that we have. Uh, so, so things like that um, help us achieve that. So, so we're appreciative. Awesome, thank you. That's uh, that was Coach Harbaugh's mission statement for us: treat people in a first-class manner while winning multiple PFL championships. When I was a football player, before I got old, uh, when I was at University of San Diego. So, and you look great with a beard and without a beard, as this slide shows. So, um, you know, you, you rock it well. Uh, Amanda, final final words and thoughts. So uh, I'm thinking we all get on a plane and go see Lance football play on Friday. I'm just kidding. Okay. Yeah. In a, yeah. NFHS Network, Friday night. I know, right? Um, you know what? It's like I said before, uh, it's been a pleasure to, to talk with all of you, Janice and Lance. And, um, you know, I hope I see you guys at the national conference at some point so we can connect. Um, JT, I appreciate you having me be part of this. Um, again, anything we can do, we're stronger together, doing it together and figuring it out. Um, and I, yeah, I appreciate the platforms and, um, Carlsbad loves snap rays, so I'm sure you'll, uh, Sam Eshelman's their new AD, and he's awesome, so um, he'll be great for you guys, too. Terrific. Well, thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. I know the attendees do as well, uh, and good luck on Friday, Lance, and, and good luck, Janice and Amanda, with your upcoming season. Go get them, Lance. Thank you. Thank you. Get it. All right. T take Bye. care. Bye.